Hey, what's good, self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great, and I wanna welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital, and today we're coming at you with another round of earnings from the US MSOs that we saw this week. So before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And then of course, if you wanna learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos. Then there's plenty of content for you to go back, watch, and re-educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so you can watch episodes over time to learn about how the industry has evolved, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and then take advantage whenever you feel ready. So we're going to start with Air Wellness, who no doubt had the most impressive earnings out of this batch of MSOs, as they reported Q2 revenue up 222% year over year to 91.3 million, up 56% sequentially. These are actually probably the best growth numbers that we've seen um, from any company revenue-wise, uh, year over year and quarter over quarter. So that is impressive to say that Air Wellness, their purchases that they made recently to expand have definitely gone a long way as providing them with a positive adjusted EBITDA or earnings before interest taxes depreciation amortization of 27.4 million on a US GAAP basis up 225% year over year and 49% sequentially. Although they did suffer an operating loss of 24.9 million which included non-cash one-time expenses and non-operating adjustments totaling 52.3 million that is the cost of expansion though to increase these revenue numbers. By investing in that expansion now, they're increasing their 2022 revenue targets to 800 million with 300 million of positive adjusted EBITDA reflecting substantial investments in growth now, uh, allowing the company to provide third quarter 2021 guidance for targeted 100 million in revenue up over 211% year over year and 10% sequentially with an adjusted EBITDA fat sequentially over Q2. Mind you, this is a big drop uh, from this 56 sequentially, so that'll be interesting to see. But on top of that, they announced three proposed acquisitions, including Levia, the leading branded cannabis beverage company, adding Illinois as eighth state and significantly expanding cultivation capacity in Nevada. So we're just going to go through mainly the quarter highlights and then the numbers uh, and dig through them. But announced proposed acquisition of Cultivana LLC, the owner of Levia, a top selling brand of cannabis infused seltzers. So there you have it, air getting into the beverage category. Announced the proposed acquisition of Herbal Remedies, adding two dispensaries in Illinois, one additional retail license in Bloomington Normal, Illinois with partner Land of Lincoln. They have expanded into Illinois, that is obviously a fast-growing adult use market, and announced the proposed acquisition of Tahoe Hydroponics Company, LLC, an award-winning cultivator and one of Nevada's top producers in high-quality flour. And on top of that, they've hired over 400 new employees across all levels, deepening our bench in marketing, technology, and operational professionals focused on driving scalable processes across our regional footprint. And so if we take a look at each place, Florida, where they just expanded into, especially by buying LA um, Liberty Health Sciences, which seemed to be a great deal for the price they got them for, continued improvement in cultivation leading to a meaningful increase in yield and production up 50% since closing the acquisition based on grams uh, by square foot harvested. Increased retail performance driven by improved quality and availability of wider selection of strains and updated product offerings including the addition of origin extracts and Big Pete's cookies brands. Transaction count up 40% in July versus January that's impressive. Average basket size up 38% and new patients up 27 so Florida is going well. Since closing February 25th, 2021, the company has opened eight additional retail locations, bringing their total store, town, store count to 39, the third largest retail footprint in Florida. In addition, three stores are expected to open by the end of the third quarter, and the company has cited an additional eight new locations, bringing its year-end Florida dispensary targets to 50%. And the company has begun construction of 20 acre of hoop houses in Florida expected to be completed this fall. What are hoop houses? I'm going to Google that after this. Western region. Revenue at newly opened sixth dispensary in Nevada, the closest dispensary to the Las Vegas airport has grown to just under 1 million a month after less than six months of operations. Completed 20,000 square foot processing facility expansion outside of Las Vegas and began production in, Google in July uh, to manufacture products of such edibles, concentration, and vapes. In Chandler, Arizona, the production facility came online in July, adding 10,000 square foot of cultivation capacity and allowing for the first sale of air products in the wholesale market. So it seems like they're starting on wholesale. And I think this is wise because when you consider states that are fast growing and have recently legalized for adult use, that's Illinois and that's Arizona. And it seems like air has just gotten into these states. Arizona retail revenue up nearly 50% year over year on the same store basis following the approval of adult use sales in the market and construction of 80,000 square foot of Phoenix, culti Phoenix cultivation expected to be completed in Q4. In the Northeast, Successful launch of Revel and Seven Hill Flowers in Pennsylvania, both of which sold out during the first week of wholesale product sales. Pennsylvania combined retail revenue reaches over 1.5 million per month in July after being open for only an average of four months. Three additional Pennsylvania dispensaries are scheduled to open later this year, bringing the total to six. Acquisition of Garden State Dispensary in New Jersey on track to close in the coming weeks. 
provisional licenses received for three adult use dispensaries in Greater Boston. With on top of that, they're selling to 112 of Massachusetts 148 adult dispensaries, and Air remains a leading wholesaler in the state. So that is good to see that, which is at least positive to add that they have more than one revenue stream. They don't have to rely just on their retail locations. They can rely on wholesaling to other dispensaries within the state and construction underway on 100,000 square foot of new cultivation and production facility in Milford, Massachusetts. That is expected to add 75,000 square foot of new canopy to bring air to the maximum capacity allowed under its Massachusetts license. And then lastly, Midwest getting into Illinois added the eighth state, Illinois, to grow a footprint with the proposed acquisition of Herbal Remedies Dispensary and license win by affiliated company Land of Lincoln. And they began production of vape carts, concentrates, RSOs, and tinctures, as well as highly edible gummies at processing facilities in Ohio. So this is, so they have a lot on the go, but the most important thing for them to reach their 2022 revenue goals of 800 million is for them to execute. And it seems like they have, so it's just a matter of time uh, that they'll continue to do so. If we look at Q1 2021, though, when they brought in 58.4 million, that did jump quite a bit to 91.3 million, representing that 222% year-over-year change and 56.1% quarter-over-quarter change. So that's very impressive. Uh, obviously helped by closing some acquisitions acquisitions, uh, but this helps brings their adjusted gross profit up to over 50% margins. So 34.2 million in Q1 of 2021 to 53.1 million in Q2 of 2021. Mind you, as we can see here, they spent a good deal in capital expenditures to obviously expand now because they see it probably more cost effective to do it now than later. Um, so you can compare that they didn't spend a whole lot and they didn't have a whole lot in operating income losses previously, but again, better to spend it now when the money's cheap and when they can, because the revenue growth and profit growth seems to be offsetting what they're spending, clearly bringing in a 53.1 million profit right there. Uh, with an adjusted EBITDA though, positive 27.4 million uh, and nice 30% adjusted EBITDA margin. So with that outlook, based on the results, management is targeting Q3 uh, 2021 revenue of approximately 100 million, which reflects growth of over 10% quarter over quarter and 21% year over year. Adjusted EBITDA on the US gap basis is expected to be in line with the second quarter following accelerated investments in branding, new markets, and growth projects. The company is increasing its targets for 2022 revenue up to 800 million up from 725 million and is reiterating guidance for 2022 adjusted EBITDA of 300 million reflecting substantial investments and growth. The company's exceptions for Q3 2021 and 2022 are based on US uh, generally accepted accounting principles reporting and subject to the assumptions and risk detailed in the MDMA for the period ending uh, for June 30th, 2021. And as we can take a look, we can just see the states that they're in, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Florida, Arizona, Nevada, and Illinois, which a lot of them are key states, uh, especially Illinois and Arizona recently opened up and New Jersey will be opened up fairly soon um, in the next 180 days of the recent news that we got yesterday. But this just shows us a clear breakdown of which one is adult use or medical market, the estimated market size, and then their current dispensary count versus where they hope to be at year end, um, where most of their dispensaries sit, so high traffic areas, and then cultivation production employees um, and planned capital expenditures and investing in uh, infrastructure and growth plans. So it's just very nice to see that clearly laid out there. Uh, but all in all, it just seems that Air Wellness is on track and expanding very well. Um, obviously, they're spending money to they're spending money now to make more money later. But uh, this is definitely in line with the revenue growth that we saw from Tier One companies. So good job, Air Wellness. Uh, in my view, I don't own any shares, but these were definitely impressive growth numbers uh, for any company in any industry. On to Terra Ascend, they report second quarter net sales of 58.7 million, positive adjusted EBITDA of 24.3 million, and adjusted EBITDA margins of 41%. And then yesterday they announced the news they signed agreements to be the sole cultivator and manufacturer of cookies branded products in New Jersey and bring cookies corners to TerraSense three dispensaries in New Jersey while unveiling the third location in highly trafficked Lodi, which is scheduled to open during the fourth quarter of 2021. Now this is all great and all, but obviously what we want to know is when is New Jersey's adult use market going to launch? Because that's going to make this all more attractive and it's going to make investing in any company in New Jersey with a footprint there more attractive as well. So the good news though is that yesterday the commission met and they decided that they need there's they have to launch within 180 days as of yesterday I believe from my understanding. So unless any new information has come out when they specifically set uh, the 180 days from I believe it's yesterday. If that changes let me know in the comments if you find anything out but that will obviously just make uh, New Jersey more attractive and we're all anticipating and waiting for that. On top of that though reports cash balance of 154 million providing strong support for future growth initiatives but but they did withdraw their 2021 guidance due to temporary yield declines in Pennsylvania related to ongoing construction and expansion and a decision to allocate more of the company's branded products to its own stores in New Jersey. So as running a business is not easy and there's a lot of moving parts, stuff does happen, but obviously this is why you want to do your research. And always remember though that you're investing in real companies that are expanding in real time and not just share prices. Because again, the share price and the company don't correlate day to day. But 
typically valuations do always follow fundamentals in time. So we're going to go down to the second quarter highlights. Um, down here, second quarter operational highlights, they acquired the remaining 90% of KCR, doubling their dispensary footprint in Pennsylvania to six. They acquired HMS Health LLC, a cultivator and processor of medical cannabis in Maryland. So they're expanding their footprint in some of these key markets, both just medical for now though, not adult use. Open second New Jersey dispensary in Maplewood, the largest apothecarium on the East Coast. Launched a portfolio of Kind Tree branded products in Maryland and made final earnout payment of 30 million to Alara Healthcare in 2021. While subsequent events, they mentioned the uh, the signed agreement with Cookies. They decided to undertake a strategic review process to explore, review, and evaluate potential alternatives for its Arise CBD business focused on maximizing shareholder value. They signed a definitive agreement to purchase an additional 12.5% of the issued outstanding equity for Terrace and New Jersey from BWH New Jersey LLC and Blue Marble Ventures LLC for total consideration of 50 million, bringing total ownership to 87.5%. The company has the option to purchase the additional an additional 6.25% at a predetermined valuation during a period commencing April 1st, 2023 through June 15th, 2023. They also promoted Ryan McWilliams to EVP of the Northeast region, succeeding Greg Rochlin, who left the company to pursue other interests subsequent to the final Alara earnout payment. And Jason Marks, the company's legal chief officer and head of corporate development, decided to leave the company in return to the life sciences sector. So those are updates from Terrasen. As we dive into the numbers, we can see their net sales did increase from 53.4 in Q1 to 58.7 in Q1. So as you notice, though, the growth did not jump a whole lot. Mainly, it seems like TerraSend is not in any of these adult use markets that were recently legalized. So hence, if you don't take advantage of getting into those new markets, you will not see as much growth. But year over year increase, still very uh, impressive, 72% year over year. And then if we take a look year to date in 2020, they have nearly doubled their revenue. So from 60.1 million earned after two quarters last year, they're up to 112.1 earned from two quarters. So that is an 86% increase, still healthy. But one thing I think is worth noting that there are no negative numbers in here. So clearly they're running their company well and they're making good use of their capital, it seems, as gross profit before gain on fair value of biological adjustments, 34.7 million. Adjusted gross profit, 35.7 million. Uh, net sales increase of 61%. And then year to date uh, from 2020 to 2021, 63% increase there. So again, they're just efficiently basically doubling what their operations are. So that's healthy to see. Their general administrative and expenses actually went down as well, which is very impressive to see. Like Q1 2021, they spent 15.8 million. Q2 2021 spent 14.8 million. So that decreased um, by about 5%. And if we look year to date, after two quarters, what they spent in 2020... Or sorry, yeah, what they spent in 2020 was just 22.2 million, and after two quarters in 2021, just eight million more or so. So uh, just goes to show that they're very uh, careful, or they manage their capital well. I think that's the best way to put it. Uh, for adjusted EBITDA of 24.3 million, uh, and again, this big increase from 2020 uh, quarter two uh, after two quarters, 12.1 million. But if we look at year to date 2021 after two quarters, up to 46.9 million. So they're keeping a lot more uh, earnings before interest taxes, appreciation, amortization, or profits. Um, and then adjusted EBITDA percentage of net sales. Increasing this is obviously probably a goal of theirs, up to 41%. And so 20 their adjusted EBITDA in 2020 represented 20% of sales. So far this year already, after two quarters, um, it represents 42% of sales, so a lot more financially healthy with a positive 3.4 million in cash flow from operations and 16.7 million cash flow from operations to date after two quarters compared to last year's 6.4 million in cash flow from operations uh, in that first or in last year. So um, all that looks very healthy, but then yeah, their main outlook, I wanted to cover this. The company is withdrawing their 2021 financial primarily, their guidance primarily to temporary reduction in yields of quality flower caused by ongoing construction and expansion in Pennsylvania, and due to increased allocation of the company's branded products in its own apothecarium dispensaries in New Jersey. So it seems like maybe they want to wholesale less to other dispensaries in the state and keep it for their own dispensary, which makes sense. While more profitable in the long run, retail sales take longer to sell through when compared to wholesale sales. When evaluating the potential of the company's dispensaries in an adult use environment, management believes prioritizing the company's retail channel in a supply constrained market is the best path, is the best path for building shareholder value. And so for the second half of 2021, although the company has withdrawn its guidance, management expects to continue to deliver strong year-over-year -year growth in revenue and adjusted EBITDA. So uh, fairly good numbers from Terrasen. I do not own any shares, but it seems like uh, they are a company that manages their cash well. And although they're not growing as big as some of the other ones, which you like to see a lot of growth because that's where, you know, the big potential gains can be had, especially when safe passes and we have that re-rating. Um, you know, it's still very healthy, though, in terms of a company that, you know, is not losing any money uh, and 
getting more profitable quarter over quarter as they move on. So on to this one, goodness growth that used to be Virio. Now, just want to let you know, I do ha hold a position in these shares and I'm down quite a bit. Uh, obviously, you know, could have invested that money smarter. Uh, had I kept that cash, I would have had more money than I do now. But obviously, you don't lose until you sell anything. But I want to use this to just point out that the main reason I invest in goodness growth or Virio is because I believe that they would be a good acquisition target because of their strategic footprint and mainly because of their footprint in New York. Because I think if anyone were to try to buy goodness growth, um, they'd have to pay a very hefty premium because they would then get access to New York, which is a very attractive um, market and a limited license market too. So not everyone can get in there. So just wanted to add that for context. Um, and yeah, obviously I'm down a good amount, but you don't lose unless you sell, right? So obviously if you just wait, um, I, I know that that value is going to come back up once the tide turns because that rising tide does lift all ships. Regardless, I'll stop um, blabbering and get into it. They saw Q2 gap revenue of 14.2 million, which increased 16% compared to Q2 2020. Excluding former PA and Ohio subsidiaries, Q2 revenue increased 45% year over year and 8% sequentially. So again, an example though of not a whole lot of growth from some of these companies, but strategically with footprints that they could bring out in the future, it does still make them very attractive investments. And then record gap, um, gross profit margins of 49% reflects greater scale and improving efficiency from operations. So I'm gonna jump down to the second quarter business highlights, then we'll go through the numbers. Um, but total revenue of 14.2 million increase, well, I might as well just do the numbers then if, if it starts off with that. Uh, let's just scroll down though. During the quarter, the company completed the planned expansion of its cultivation and processing facility in New Mexico, which is now fully operational. The company now has four operating dispensaries and 13,000 square foot of cultivation capacity in the New Mexico market, which is expected to transition to adult use sales in the spring of calendar year 2022, pending development of operational uh, of operating regulations. During the quarter, the company announced the launch of its ground medical cannabis flower products in the state of New York as they recently announced the allowed flower. The ground flower line is being sold in 3.5 grams and 7 gram jars and will be expanded to feature indica, sativa, and hybrid strains such as Killer Kush, Wedding Cake, and the kosher approved Tangy Kush. These products will be available at all four of the company's dispensaries in New York and via home delivery. And so just think when New York becomes uh, legal for adult use, that's going to be a lot of people, 21 million, that could potentially help accelerate the sales there. And on June 9th, 8th to 9th, the company is hosting its inaugural Investor Day events, during which the company discusses its long-term outlook for its various state markets and also announced that its subsidiary, Resurgent Biosciences, plans to expand into re its research into psychedelics. Resurgence is a non-plant fungus touching entity and does not intend to engage directly in cultivation, manufacturing, or distribution of any psychedelics. So, and so honestly, as an investor, Investor myself, the more they sort of shift into psychedelics and shift away from medical cannabis, which I thought was Dr. Kyle Kingsley, their CEO strong suit, the less I really want to be invested in the company. But hey, you live and you learn, and you know sometimes your plan has to change based on the company that you've invested in, what their plans are, and what they change to. But at the end of the day, this does not take away from the fact I still own Vireo. I'm down quite a bit, but I still own them, and I'm not going to sell because I know that when the trend changes, they are going to rise like all the other ships do typically, and we've seen that before, and we're likely going to see it again. And also Warren Buffett its rule in investing, don't lose money. And you know, they're a smaller position, so it's not like I have a lot of my capital in goodness growth, but at the end of the day, you know, I might be down a good percentage. I'm not gonna sell for a loss because I think in time that that's gonna rise back up. And ultimately, if you don't sell your equity while it's down, you don't lose. That's why patience is so important because you know, if you look at it and you make it seem like a big deal, then it's gonna become a big deal. If you ignore it and you don't give it a lot of your energy, it's not going to become a big deal and take up a lot of your energy. That being said, I'm going to stop rambling. Uh, yeah, generally accepted accounting revenue in 2021 up to 14.2 million, up from 12.2 million in 2020. So that is a 16.5% increase year over year. Not a whole lot of growth, um, but yeah, that could just goes to show that Vireo is you know moving at a much slower pace than some of the other MSOs, but they're not aiming as big. Their revenue excluding former PA and Ohio subsidiaries um, up to 14.2 uh, from 9.8 last year. So that is a bigger increase, but main thing is that their gross profit did actually increase by 92.5%. And obviously this is because they're working with much smaller numbers, right? 3.6 goes up to 6.9. Wow, that looks like a big increase because it is. And year over year, as we can see two months in, in 2020, they had managed just 6.9 million in profits uh, after everything said and done in 2021, that's already up to 12.5. So, uh, you know, in terms of being smaller numbers, that growth is bigger and nice to see. 
as they, though, mainly increased their gross profit margins to 48.6, uh, up from 29.4 last year. So I think this is a big increase, and this will still make them a very attractive potential M&A merger, because if you're buying a company, would you rather buy, buy a company that has 48% gross profit margins or 29% gross profit margins? Obviously, 48.6, because they're keeping a lot more profits. That being said, their SG&A expenses did increase to 8.5 million, up from 6.3 million, but good to see that's not, you know, a much bigger increase, and then year over year, it's it's just an increase of $3 million, so it seems like they're managing their money well. Um, and then SG&A percentage of sales, 58.3 up from 51.4. And so obviously these two, not they don't correlate exactly, but um, we want to see that as they're keeping more profit, hopefully their SG&A, um, their costs for uh, selling general administrative is going down. But this leaves them with a negative adjusted EBIT of $1 million, which is an improvement of negative $1.8 million last quarter. And again, if we look from 2020 to 2021, uh, two quarters in, they were at negative 4.9 last year, down to negative 2.7. So they're improving those numbers as well. But as they're a small company, it's going to take them time to be profitable. It seems like they should be able to reach profitability by next quarter. So that's really all I wanted to cover on here. Um, last thing I actually wanted to go down just to show you why I also think they're a very attractive M&A target is because total current liabilities were just 16.1 million with 1.1 million in debt due within the next 12 months. So as of right now, they do not have a lot of debt, which I see as a positive because if a company were to try to acquire them, you're not taking on a lot of extra baggage or debt. But then their outlook, the company Horizons strategy was unveiled during its recent Investor Days events and is planned for growth fiscal year in 2022. Over the time frame, the company expects to open an additional 6 to 10 green goods retail dispensaries and a majority of the company's markets are expected to begin to generate more substantial revenue growth as pending changes to regulatory regimes take effect. So uh, other thing to add though, management has provided various outlook ranges for performance of fiscal 2022 year, the achievement of which is dependent on the company's ability to achieve expected biomass production yields, the timing and completion of various development projects, the timing of commitments of adults use the timing of commencement of adult use sales in New Mexico and New Jersey, and the timing of commencement of flower sales in the Minnesota medical market. So I would just say this has not been one of my better investments in time, but I have no doubt that it's going to go back up. Uh, and just to point out where my shares are at $2.82, you'd be getting a massive discount even from where I bought them at this point. So it's not to say that they're unattractive or anything, but they're just not going to be growing as quickly as some of the other MSOs. So you just have to take that into effect if you were to invest in, say, a company like Goodness Growth. Now this one onto the parent company reports second quarter 2021 financial results. So also known as TPCO Holdings Corp, they achieved Q2 net sales of 54.2 million and they maintain industry leading balance sheet with 257.0 million in cash. Don't know if that's industry leading, but they do have a good amount of cash to play with, which is a positive going forward. And the NEO, which is a Canadian exchange, accepts normal cash, normal course issuer bid for common shares and warrants of up to 25 million. And they expand their consumer reach to over 70% of California and acquires additional consumer hub delivery hub in Sacramento, California. Now, a few things to point out here. Um, nets, well, let's just go through actually the operational highlights. So uh, Sean Jay-Z Carter's monogram challenges national drug policy and launches digital and out-of-home awareness campaign to magnify the hypocrisies of cannabis legalization legislation. Great uh, effort by Jay-Z there, and it's obviously true at this point. It's just ridiculous. Served over 58,000 customers and processed over 150k consumer transactions. Launched Fun Uncle Cruisers, a disruptive entry into the value vape category, netting 3.5% of California market share by units in first quarter of launch, according to BDSA data from April to June. Over 20,000 consumers have enrolled in the company's newly launched 423 integrated loyalty program, Kaliva Club. Monogram launched a... Oh, so this is that app that they launched. Interesting. So they've got 23,000 consumers. Doesn't seem like a great turnout, really, to begin with. Uh, but obviously, this is fairly new, launched uh, in April. But to think, if you've got to download an app to buy from just this one company, it's an interesting approach. We'll see how that plays out over time. Monogram launched a campaign that re-images the iconic photos of renowned mid-century American photographer Slim Aarons through contemporary lens. So they're doing a lot of artistic work, but, you know, how are they making more money? <laughs> That's the main thing. Appointed Desiree Perez, CEO of Rock Nation to the Board of Directors, signed a definitive agreement to acquire four acres of outdoor cultivation located in Sonoma County, California, from uh, Mosaic Ag, an affiliate of Soma Rosa Farms. They dispose of the company's 34% minority interest in Half Moon Grow, as well as the company's Akai Puree business line. They entered into a definitive agreement to sell its hemp CBD business unit in Arcadia Biosciences, Inc., um, a leader in science-based approaches to enhance the quality and nutritional content of crops and food ingredients for $4 million in cash. 
and 827,400 shares of Arcadia stock. They appointed Social Equity Fund Advisory Committee members, completed first Social Equity investment in Josephine and Billy's, completed se second Social Equity investment in the Peaks Company. So if we go down here, a few more things, subsequent events that happened after leading up to this quarter. Expands California retail footprint through the acquisition of Comma West Hollywood. Improved value vape offering with launch of Fun Circle Cruisers Vapes with Live Resin. Now, open a new delivery hub in San Diego via Caliva's direct-to-consumer platform. So that is interesting. At least they are sort of catering to this uh, new direct-to-consumer platform with the ability to deliver directly to them. So that could obviously help uh, retain customers if they like the service. Launched first of its kind cannabis mobile shopping app through Apple Store to improve cannabis accessibility. Sort of these two same things play off of each other. Announced voluntary board of directors and executive team lockup agreements. Strengthened its California retail footprint through the acquisition of Jaden's Journeys in Ceres, California. And they filed the Form 10 registration statement with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission in advance of potentially being permitted to list common shares and warrants on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. Now, that being said, if we look through here, they don't actually provide the numbers, which is very annoying for me because the numbers help you cut right through the fancy wording and see what's improving quarter over quarter. Now, I'm being a bit lazy though, and you can go to CDAR and pull up their Q10, but this is what I want to highlight. As their net sales in Q2 2021 were 54.2 million, representing approximately 18.9% growth compared to the adjusted Q2 2021 revenue of approximately 45.6. This was driven by 7.2% growth in the company's direct to consumer business and 22%. 0.6% growth in wholesale revenue. But gross profits in Q2 2021 was 8.1 million, representing gross margins of just 15% in Q1 2021. So that is not ideal. 15% margins, especially in a high growth plant touching uh, industry, that is not going to compete long run. With the company's focus on driving strong direct to consumer sales, the parent company expects to shift its sales to more higher margin product categories, which over time is expected to drive expanded gross profits. So interesting. They think that they can retain customers and then sell more expensive products to them over time, which is possible. And that might be their approach going forward. But just interestingly enough, operating expenses in Q2 2021 were 60.7 million, of which 31.6 million were non-cash expenses. In the quarter, cash expenses primarily included general and administrative costs of 11 million, salaries and benefits of 10.4 million, sales and marketing expenses of 7.4 million, and rent expenses of 100K. Um, but then also adjusted EBITDA loss for the second quarter was 10.4 million. Adjusted EBITDA loss in Q2 2021 was primarily attributable to the ongoing operations in the company's core business. So yes, of course you do have to spend money um, to make money. Just these numbers are fundamentals that I would not want to invest in. So I just wanted to highlight that as much as, you know, that you can come out with the marketing, um, with, you know, some artistic, uh, you know, approaches to getting the message across about cannabis, which no doubt the legislation needs to be changed because it's ridiculous. Sadly, for me, the parent company, the numbers are just not cutting it. And then lastly, on to grow generation, where the pros go to grow now. I just wanted to use this as a comparison to like Home Depot because, um, most of the MSOs that I focus on are plant touching companies. So that is where they focus on, you know, dealing with the plant cultivation, distribution, and sale. Whereas grow generation is like the home Depot of cannabis, where if you want to, you know, home grow yourself, you can go to grow generation and get the materials in order to do that. So it's a good way to think of them differently, but, uh, for that reason, they are different than plant touching MSOs in a few ways, which I will cover as we go through this. But I did want to include them as one of the viewers uh, commented and wanted to see this. So we'll break through, the, break this down, um, because grow generation is also a great, you know, way to diversify in the cannabis industry. Uh, I just personally decided to stick with plant touching companies myself. It's just a personal choice. But so if we go through this, record revenue increased 190% to 125.9 million, net income of 6.7 million, up 161% year over year. So these are phenomenal growth numbers as well, coming from a different sector of the cannabis industry with adjusted EBITDA of 14.5 million, a 229% increase, 220 or 2021 revenue guidance raised to 455 to 475 million. So comparable store sales for the quarter increased 60% from prior year. So that's very impressive, especially for, uh, you know, a retail business where they're going to have big stores, you go to them to shop. And I imagine they're probably going to do e-commerce, uh, and some sort of variation of that in time, but record diluted earnings of positive 11 cents per share in the quarter. So it's great to see companies in this industry becoming profitable as the plant touching flowers are. Now we're going to go through the, the highlights. Revenue rose 190% to 129 or 125.9 million for the second quarter of 2021 versus 43.5 million for the same period last year. Same store sales at 24 locations open for the same period in 2020 to 2021 were 62.1 million in second quarter 2021 versus 38.9 million for the same period last year, a 60% increase year over year. 
gross profit margin for the second quarter, uh, 2021 was 28.4 percent compared to 26.7 in the same quarter last year, an increase of 170 basis points. So this is the biggest thing to highlight, though. I think with grow generation compared to plant touching companies, plant touching companies are aiming for margins of about 50 percent and up because they can. Once you get the operations done and the execution done well, once the costs are down, if you can scale that well, the margins are high. Whereas with uh, an operation like this where you're selling appliance or not appliances but you're selling the equipment you're just not going to see as high of margins so that's why they've got 24.8 percent up to 26.7 percent now ideally they will grow these margins in time as they cut costs and um, improve their systems but just goes to show there's a big difference between the average gross margins and again margins is what you keep the profits you keep after all the cost of goods sold right so ideally over time the more profit you can keep the more uh What's the word I'm looking for? Valuable the company becomes because you can make money from your current operations. And so income before tax or profit was 9.6 million for the second quarter 2021 versus 2.7 million for the same period last year. But clearly year over year, they're increasing their profits by a good amount. So as they continue to improve their operations, that's something that we can expect to continue over time. Net income was 6.7 million or positive 11 cents per share. Adjusted EBITDA was 14.5 million in the second quarter of 2021 versus 4.4 million for the same period last year. Again, positive, very worth noting compared to Canadian LPs where a lot of those numbers are in the negatives. Um, private side labels, including the power of Psy and Shark uh, were 7% of revenue compared to less than 1% for the same period last year. So some of their products are becoming more popular too. E-commerce revenue was 12 million. So yes, of course, they've already started e-commerce uh, compared to 3.3 million for the same period last year. And this is going to make them a lot more profitable, I would imagine, including agron.io and all of our e-commerce sites. Cash and short-term securities was 124.5 million. Financial highlights net revenue for the six months ended uh, was 215.9 million compared to 76.4 million for the six months ended. So that includes Q1 and Q2 of last year compared to Q1 and Q2 of this year, representing an increase of 139.5 million or 182%. That is fundamentally strong growth. The gross profit margin was 28.3 for the six months ended compared to 26.9. So it seems like they're going to be in that range, but obviously the, just the higher that they can make that over time versus uh, going down, the better for them. With net income for the six months ended positive was 12. 9 million compared to net income of just 0.5 million for six months ended last year. With M&A activity, the company acquired Downriver Hydroponics, a Michigan-based indoor garden center in Wayne County. And in May 2021, the company acquired the Harvest Company, a Northern California-based garden center with operations in Redding in Hayfork, California. So just think of them gobbling up the biggest equipment department stores for gardening and growing and hydroponics. And that's going to make them the Home Depot of you know, cannabis going forward. I, I, I would see that that's a fair uh, comparison. Then expansion efforts. The company's supply chain spans approximately 875,000 square feet of retail and warehouse space across existing locations and sign leases in new locations spanning 13 states. So seems like their best play is to get into, is to try and buy up the biggest equipment uh, companies that they can find in April 2021. Uh, the company entered in a lease of 4,000 square foot facility in Jackson, Mississippi, the 13th state of operation. In May 2021, the company announced the building of six Oklahoma locations of the sixth Oklahoma location in Ardmore. The company announced the addition of 52,000 square feet in downtown Los Angeles and 70,000 square feet in Rancho Dominguez, California, that will serve as distribution and fulfillment locations for the company. That's for their e-commerce. And then the company is in the process of building additional locations that will serve as fulfillment centers that include 25,000 square feet in Phoenix, Arizona. 58,000 square feet in Medley, Florida. These locations are expected to be open by fall 2021. And keep in mind, they're likely expanding into states that have legal adult use or medical. There are a lot of states that still can, you know, loosen the regulations and reform their laws that Grow Generation can eventually get into as well. So then lastly, subsequent events, July 2021, the company entered into an asset purchase agreement to acquire HGS Hydro, the nation's third largest chain of hydroponic garden centers, with six stores across Michigan and seven stores slated to open in the fall of 2021. In July 2021, the company company acquired Aqua Serene, a Southern Oregon-based hydroponic garden center uh, with stores in Eugene and Ashland, Oregon. And in July 2021, the company acquired Mendocino Greenhouse and Garden Supply, the Northern California-based hydroponic garden center located in Mendocino, California. So just think of that differently, as opposed to trying to acquire lower plant-touching growers like other MSOs. These guys want to get into um, they want to be the equipment providers. And so that seems to be their goal. Now, one thing just to point out, though, as well, is like looking at their balance sheet, they're just much smaller companies with the amount of assets and liabilities they have on hand than the larger MSOs as well. Um, not exactly sure why that is, but you know, a lot less goodwill, a lot less intangible assets, but that being said, a lot less cash on hand for them. Um, 
but then also just going down to show that you know it, it's it's going to be their prerogative going forward to cut their cost of sales as much as possible as they expand because that will allow them to keep more gross profit over time um, keep higher gross margins and ultimately add more value to their shareholders so great job out of grow generation and honestly these msos that reported this week also did very well so if we turn to the u.s cannabis fundamentals so with that said though you can take all the companies that we've just mentioned you can find them on this list now this list is ranked and ordered by market cap so as we can see from the companies we just went through terrace end is the highest valued at 2.3 billion based Based on the sales that they plan to bring in and honestly if you were to compare terrasend to air wellness right now air wellness is trading at a discount of about four billion dollars compared to terrasend and they're going to be bringing in probably double the amount of sales uh that terrasend is going to bring in for full year 2022 so clearly you are just based on the numbers and the data and the fundamentals seems like you'd be getting a better bang for your buck by investing into air wellness than in terrasend right now and waiting for the end of 2022 now again this is not investment advice this is just based off of what we can see right in front of us, right? And if we go down the list though, we can see that Grow Generation is just behind uh, Air Wellness actually with a market cap of 1.6 billion. Now again, they are in a different line of business. Uh, so you're gonna wanna educate yourself on maybe you know the equipment business uh, and, and retail a little bit more, um, but Grow Generation is here and you can see they are still trading at a very low price to sales compared to their full 2021 guidance and full 2022. And if we go down the list, then you can find um, the parent company down here. So, you know, compared to the, considering their margins are just 15%, which is not great. They're still only valued at 400, like less than 500 million. So it's probably a pretty good steal if they can end up bringing in 593 million by the end of 2022, uh, putting them at a price to sales of one right now. So like, again, that's hard to say no to. If I had, if I had, you know, unlimited amounts of cash, I would be building positions in all of these companies and waiting for safe to pass, but I don't. So that's why I have finite amounts of capital. So I've invested in what I can invest in. And then lastly, just if we go down though, we can find goodness growth down here, valued at just 214 million, obviously bringing in a lot less, but they have that New York play in that footprint, which does make them a potential good MDMA and MDNA target, but then just to point out that like, if you look at what they're going to do in 2022, buying them now, price to sales of one, which is incredibly cheap in terms of fundamentals, uh, if that's something that you look at as a value investor or a value growth investor. But so just wanted to show you all this. Obviously, you know, the more that you educate yourself and learn about investing, the more that you can identify certain, you know, patterns and make these decisions yourself. So I definitely recommend sticking to this. You know, it's not something that you want to invest and then just forget about it. The more that you can stay on top of your investments, uh, you know, take in this content and, and notice things for yourself, the, the smarter investor that you can eventually be in the long run. That is it for today's episode and the recap of these recent MSO earnings. So I want to thank you so much for tuning in and I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think about any of the companies mentioned or the fundamentals that we can see in the U.S. Cannabis Investor Portal? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or concerns and I'd be happy to try to address them. Besides that, if you enjoyed this video or you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below so you don't miss any future videos and I will catch you on Sunday for this week in cannabis news. Have a great Friday, everybody.